we can uh, start the webinar. Wait, it's Claire not joining us? Oh, okay. I thought she was introducing. Um, okay, so it's me then. <laughs> so everyone, welcome to the webinar. Uh, welcome to those people who are watching us online and who are joining us from Konien in the Netherlands. Um, so the, the meeting is being uh, conducted in English and in French. So if you want to um, choose on Zoom at the bottom, we have simultaneous uh, interpretation. Uh, so you'll, you, know, you can listen in the language of your choice or you can listen in the original language. Alors, uh, si vous voulez entendre en français, vous pouvez changer uh, le langage uh, en bas um the zoom dans interpretation um so we have an exciting webinar planned for you today it's a it's a virtual and in-person event so we have people online from around the world to kind of set the ball rolling in the discussion uh from different uh international perspectives and then we have uh people gathered today in Honian uh, to have an in-person discussion and to take this further really for, for solutions for honing in itself. Um, so the, the webinar is being hosted by the Water Adaptation Community of the Global Centre on Adaptation. Um, the community was created to be a multi-task, uh, a multi-stakeholder platform for knowledge and action supporting scaling up and acceleration of water adaptation. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is through sharing knowledge and best practice and really helping to accelerate um, how we apply best practices across the, the globe, learning from each other's experience. So the topic of this webinar is scaling up nature-based solutions for adaptation in coastal areas. And we have, uh, we're lucky enough to have people um, from uh, Denmark, uh, obviously the Netherlands, uh, from the UK, uh, I'm from Canada myself, and we also have people from Senegal. Um, so um, we have really a varied uh, range of experience on the line and in the room, um, and I want to make sure that people in the, in the virtual room and in the in-person room can also interact, so um, there will be a chance to join the discussion, and I really encourage you to do that because it makes it much more valuable and kind of can, you can get much more out of it. Um, so we're looking at coastal environments, so the interface with the land and ocean. Um, one of the consequences of global warming, obviously, is an increase in sea levels. And in many places, we're also looking at storm surges. Uh, for example, in Canada, we're also looking at differences in sea ice. So there's a whole range of risks that we need to manage. And we have a lot of uh, coastal communities that we need to have a, a, you know, a really good plan of how we are going to live with uh, coastal risks and, and live better with them as well as with nature. So we're going to look at um, kind of different ways of adapting uh, along the coast and examples of where this is already being taken forward and how what the success factors were that helped those projects along the way. So um, we are going to discuss challenges and opportunities, but obviously I hope that everybody can go away from this webinar with something that they've learned and that will help, help them kind of, uh, you know, accelerate the movement to putting nature-based solutions into practice because there, there are obviously a fair few challenges with this, but um, I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion of the benefits, but we see that these solutions are still underused. So um, we, we, want to, we want to change that around the world. So, um, so yeah, that's, that would, that's the aim of the webinar. Um, in terms of um, myself, so I am Joanna Akem. I am the Managing Director of Climate Resilient Infrastructure at the Intech Center on Climate Adaptation, which is based at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Um, so it is actually very early in the morning here for me, so I'm at the wrong end of the time zone. Um, but working with nature is really at the heart of my career. Um, I've worked as a professional geoscientist, uh, mainly geomorphology, for over 20 years in Canada and also in the UK, predominantly on climate adaptation, flood and coastal erosion management, and habitat restoration, which all kind of go to bed and go to, together in a nice package. Um, so I've been using my experience recently in, in Europe um, to try and accelerate uptake of nature-based solutions in Canada, because we're it's a little bit more emerging uh, here in Canada than it is in other countries. Um, and I'm 
I also speak French, so if you want to reach out in either language, that is that is completely fine. And I je vais je vais essayer de de parler un peu des deux langues, surtout avec uh, la discussion avec nos amis uh, au Sénégal, uh, pour que ça puisse interactif. Puis uh, mais Toutefois, on a de, 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 de traduction, alors um, vous pouvez écouter dans quelle langue vous voulez. Um, OK. So, um, maybe if we can go to my presentation now, Lucia. So, I'm going to give a brief overview of um, kind of so combining natural and gray infrastructure, uh, particularly with some perspectives from Canada around the work that I've been recently working on, but also um, to kind of set the table for the discussion. So I have some kind of four questions at the end that will hopefully fuel our discussions. Um, so um, um, as a geomorphologist, I've always been passionate about working with natural processes and people and the way we manage our coasts and rivers. And we, we urgently need a plan for coastal communities. We have a range of solutions in hand. So nature-based solutions is obviously one of them and that we can achieve multiple benefits. So I'm going to talk about some of those things uh, with some perspectives, um, which kind of mix, mix a little bit actually UK and Canadian experiences. Um, so maybe we can go to the next slide. So um, coastal adaptation considers flooding and erosion, but also in tandem with people and nature. And I think, you know, the way we work with people and nature, um, we maybe didn't think, consider those elements as much when we started off managing uh, flooding and erosion risk. It was more kind of seen as a technical problem to be solved. Um, and we were kind of often controlling natural processes. And I think with climate change, we're now kind of getting to the point where those natural processes are actually kind of more extreme or stronger or more difficult to control. So uh, we are kind of reevaluating how we are living with uh, coastal flooding and, and erosion, which obviously at the base are also natural processes. So, um, so we're kind of seeing an international movement towards solutions that are more strategic and long-term. So looking at timescales of up to a hundred years rather than just in the short term. Uh, looking at working with natural processes at the functional scale. I have a nice little drawing of a literal cell. So um, showing how sediment is naturally eroded, transported, deposited. And we often have come into that and modified these systems. So, um, you know, we need to be cognizant of what processes are going on and um, how our interactions have already affected them and how our future interactions will continue to either continue to affect or potentially restore these kind of processes. Um, we look at um, combining structural and non-structural measures. So, you know, protection is not the only way of coastal adaptation. So I think that's uh, becoming more apparent in how we approach this issue. And combining grey and natural infrastructure solutions. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about that a little bit more, but it's not really a choice between the two, we can actually mix them as well, which I can of often at some sites is the best solution. Um, but ultimately nature-based solutions, as I said, are currently underused. And I would also say undervalued. Um, so, cause they often um, bring multiple benefits that are more difficult to put into monetary terms. So uh, often we don't appreciate the full value of these solutions. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So um, one of the frameworks that we have been looking at, and it was um, actually, this is a modification of one of my colleagues um, framework from the University of Waterloo. Uh, so it's the power framework um, that we look at different ways of how we can, how we can react or kind of proactively plan for, I should say, for coastal flood risk, uh, sea level rise and the coastal erosion. So the first and the most traditional approach is to protect. So, um, this is more kind of structural, um, traditionally would be structural um, solutions. Um, so, so things like seawalls and uh, scare protection, but, but more and more we are seeing that nature-based solutions are actually being used in this context as coastal protection where 
uh, conditions are you know good for these systems because we we don't want to put the wrong thing in the wrong place and it's often uh, you know uh, one size does not fit all um, so there's protection so it kind of you know defending the line if you like or defending uh, kind of reducing flood risk for coastal communities um, then we might look at accommodate which is um, looking at kind of uh, you know flood proofing homes like letting the water in but just kind of uh, dealing with it when it is in so looking at wet flood proofing elevated homes that kind of thing uh, the R would be for retreat um, so this is where we are looking at where it's actually uh, considered unsustainable or not desirable to continue to uh, protect areas of coast and we're actually seeing areas kind of set back and uh, habitats restored and um, kind of you know uh, in the long term, uh, reverting to more natural processes on certain areas of our coast. And then avoid, which is using um, things like land zoning, um, land acquisition, et cetera, to move infrastructure or um, to make sure infrastructure is not constructed in the first place at, in areas at risk. Um, so this is the para framework. And actually I've been involved with um, several discussions with in indigenous groups in Canada at the moment where we're trying to be much more inclusive and working towards uh, reconciliation with, uh, with First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. And actually some alternatives have come out of those discussions. So whether we should think of it, because we, we often think of ourselves as separate to nature, but um, we could think of ourselves as more part of nature. So um, alternatives that were discussed rather than protect uh, it would be to protect each other, so protect people, but also protect nature at the same time. Um, accommodate could be seen more as host, hosting nature, um, so, you know, living together. Uh, retreat could be classed as move together, so it's not only us that might be moving, it's also coastal systems and coastal ecosystems. And then avoid maybe could be seen as respect, um, I think I added the last one myself, but it seemed to fit into that, that, that terminology. So, um, so just a way of thinking of how we might, you know, it's not nature in us, it's us within nature. So uh, I think that maybe that can set the tone for us the day. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so nature-based solutions are not just here to tackle an environmental issue and are not an environmental kind of, um, you know, it's not, it's not just for the environment that we're doing this. So this is a graph here of uh, catastrophic insurable loss claims in Canada. And we see very strongly that this is going up and, you know, obviously climate change is ongoing. There's many factors of underlying this trend where we're now at about $2 billion of insured claims. Uh, and this is just, obviously those insured claims. So everything that is not insured, which is estimated to be about three to four times this is not on the graph. And that's costs being incurred directly by governments, businesses and individuals. So we're at about $2 billion of, of insured loss claims. So that's probably more like uh, six to $8 billion a year. Um, and obviously degradation of natural infrastructure is also a contributing effect to our reduced resilience to flooding and erosion. So, um, you know, one of the, the things that we're looking at is how we use uh, natural systems to reduce risk and to reduce costs to, to society of coping with uh, disasters or natural hazards and how we, when we have to react to them rather than actively planning to them. Uh, next slide, please. So, and we're also seeing a lot more attention to um, valuing ecosystem goods and services. So these are the services that nature-based solutions provide to people that uh, benefit us, that we are less tangible than financial kind of often traditional monetary benefits that we make include in our cost benefit analyses. So these might think in like things like provisioning, for example, fish or shellfish, uh, regulation and support, flooding, erosion control obviously that's what we're talking about today mainly but also uh, air, and air and water quality temperature control carbon storage and sequestration obviously receiving a lot of attention because of trading in carbon markets and offsets and the race to net zero um, as well as biodiversity local biodiversity and habitat 
um, enhancement. <clears throat> and then not forgetting that obviously the cultural benefits of nature, uh, which I think in COVID times have been very much pushed to the fore. Uh, things like recreation opportunities, aesthetic value, uh, spiritual and education opportunities. Uh, and these are just not services that are generally offered by grey infrastructure, but yet sometimes we don't really effectively figure them into our option appraisal process when we're choosing how we should cope with coastal risks. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I think that there is more awareness of how these are part of the economy. Uh, probably many of you saw the Descapta review that came out last year, which was uh, a, a kind of a, a landmark uh, publication from the UK, which really pictured ecosystems as a fundamental basis of our economy and also, you know, the key interactions between what we traditionally think of our econ as economy, which what you might call produced capital, um, but also how that interacts with human capital. So natural capital, produced capital and human capital working together as the economy rather than seeing it as the economy separated from nature. And with ecosystems, both biodiversity, which we obviously see a lot of attention to biodiversity because it's very important, but also the abiotic processes that are part of nature, uh, which also provide ecosystem services to people and enable uh, uh, kind of traditional economy, what you, the produce capital to be produced. Um, so I think this is helping us in how we think about nature and its worth to us um, because we haven't traditionally valued it in monetary terms. Um, so it's kind of setting, setting us straight a little bit on uh, our value system. Next slide, please. As I said, it's not a choice between gray and natural solutions. And this was very much work, uh, part of the work that um, we've been doing here in Canada. This publication came out at the end of last year. So looking at basically how we can use gray and nature-based solutions, whether they be sediment-based or predominantly vegetation-based, um, how they can be used to achieve multiple benefits and the fact that in many cases, actually, grey infrastructure may be required to enable nature-based solutions where we have actually already modified the solution, the, the processes that are occurring. For example, if we want to restore a, a dune or a beach environment, but there's no sediment supply, then we may need to use grey infrastructure to create conditions to supply that sediment or to hold the sediment that we have in a more stable position. So um, there, there are kind of ways that we can facilitate nature-based solutions by providing the right conditions um, and also that nature-based na nature -based solutions can be used to enhance gray infrastructure so even if we are going to use gray infrastructure solutions because of uh, high energy wave environments for example then actually you know we, we may be able to also um, use natural infrastructure uh, alongside or as part of those solutions as well next slide please So in, uh, I think there's increasing recognition of this. And in Canada, we are particularly seeing a broadening of the view of what is infrastructure. Um, so we, have, we are actually developing a national adaptation strategy at the moment. And there is a table um, that's called resilient natural and built infrastructure. So really considering both types of infrastructure together. Um, our national infrastructure assessment that we uh, will be completing in the coming uh, couple, of, I think the coming year, um, we'll be covering all sectors, including natural infrastructure. So uh, that will be included as infrastructure there. And we have a specific fund from Infrastructure Canada to fund natural infrastructure in particular. So all kind of signals that you know, nature-based solutions and natural infrastructure are being considered more in terms of the services they offer to our people. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I think, you know, it, making a case for nature-based solutions and their co-benefits up front is very much part of upscaling and um, accelerating their implementation. So um, obviously there's a lot of key benefits from um, from nature-based solutions that we've already measured, mentioned. And there's a lot of uh, movement I have seen kind of in Canada and internationally towards modeling the monetary value of these um, 
these benefits so that we can compare options on a, and, and their benefits more um, robustly, uh, considering all the benefits, not just those that are easy to put in a dollar value or a pound value or um, a euro value. Um, so these are things like modeling in invest, for example, which many people in the room may have used also looking at predicted changes in indicators for that can be kind of uh, semi-quantitative or ranking kind of analysis, use of the social value of carbon. Um, and also obviously we look at avoided costs, um, but we are still, we're still not as strong sometimes at, at, at representing or kind of measuring these or anticipating these benefits. So. Uh, when we, we had a workshop recently, when we were preparing the coastal report, we asked people how strongly, how strongly thought we were at measuring physical, biological, and social outcomes. And you can see the triangle that um, came out of that discussion. So pretty middling about physical and uh, biological outcomes, but much less strong on measuring social outcomes. So those kind of recreational or aesthetic values, um, you know, we're not necessarily as strong at that sometimes. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to present a quick example from Percy in Quebec, uh, which is a project that uh, there's a group called Ufanas here in, in Quebec um, that basically did a um, a more robust cost benefit analysis for um, the Alps du Sud, uh, which is a very, a very much a tourist town in uh, I guess it's a Percy is a, a touristic town because you can maybe see on the small photo there is a nice coastal archway um, that people really love to come and see and it's part of a, a very much a kind of a road trip route uh, around the coast of Quebec. Um, so it's a very popular destination, but it was, um, you know, suffering very serious erosion and flooding issues as well with sea level rise. So um, Bohunas uh, considered five alternatives, considering things like a concrete seawall, a rip wrap, a rubble mound revetment, but also reach, beach replenishment and a more kind of nourishment system. Uh, including they did look at using groins as well, but they basically the cost benefit analysis uh, compared non intervention to these different options over a 50, they considered a 50 year time frame. Um, and they tried to look at things like the economic value of uh, gain in tourism revenues, for example, improvement of fish spawning grounds, uh, recreational use, quality of life and change improvement of the landscape. So they try to put these into monetary terms. And when we consider uh, these benefits, um, it's actually the cost benefit rate, the benefit cost ratio was 68 to one for the beach replenishment scheme versus you know, much lower for the more traditional engineering schemes of looking at kind of hard wall protections um, and a particularly large benefit from the tourist industry. So um, I think it stresses that when we take these multiple benefits into account, um, things that work more with, with natural processes can be far more beneficial than we would otherwise think if we're just looking at traditional financial values. Next slide, please. The other thing that's going on in Canada that uh, I'd like to kind of share with you is natural asset management. So uh, Canadian local governments and municipalities are um, looking at inventory and valuing their, uh, their natural assets and also developing standards for how they identify them and reflecting the value of those assets in their financial statements. So that is obviously a positive thing. If we see the benefit of nature-based solutions on balance sheets, then obviously that pushes home the value. Okay, next slide, please. So just, we're going to move into our panel now and uh, but thoughts to build on that uh, I would like to kind of put out there before we do that is, um, so the use and valuing of uh, nature-based solutions is maturing but it's not yet a mainstream solution. So maybe we can be thinking about how we can change this. Um, long term, strategic and long-term approaches are key, but we're not always taking them in, in all places. Local governments and communities are important in managing and valuing natural assets. 
and the absence of perfect approaches should not get in the way of incorporating good practice to accelerate nature-based solutions and implementation because essentially we we don't have time to be perfect necessarily and maybe good and, and good best practice is you know good enough to get us moving so just some thoughts so to build on these thoughts we're really lucky to have a panel of international experts joining us from around the world uh, we have some questions to discuss, but as I said, we're not tied to our script and we're really hoping that our audience members online and in Honing can actively join in the discussion. I can actually see that the chat is fairly busy. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but maybe I'll have a look while everyone is, uh, is uh, just presenting to you. So we're going to start off by considering specific case study examples from around the world and lessons that we can learn from them. Uh, so I'm joined by Albert Voss, who is the project manager for the intergovernmental project IBP Bleu in Ems Dollard that I, I looked up actually and I, I realized that that also means high tide or uh, flood tide in, in Dutch, so that's great and a great acronym, well done on that. Um, I'm also joined by, uh, I'm just going to introduce the presenters and then they're going to run through a kind of a three minute um, kind of uh, perspective presentation of so that you know where they're coming from. Uh, we also have Ode Fid, who's a, a associate professor in landscape architecture and planning at the University of Copenhagen, just bringing some examples from Denmark. Uh, on our captain, Didier Courbourg, qui est le conservateur de la marine protégée de Saint-Louis, au Sénégal, ou, et aussi de Sénégal, nous avons euh, à l'entente de, de Moussa Sal, qui est le coordinateur de l'Observatoire régional du littoral ouest africain à Dakar. Et puis, um, on a un quatrième personne qui est Paul, we have Paul Sayers, of, uh, Sayers and Partners, who brings a real wealth of experience in adapting cities and coastal areas in the UK. So we, these are our four panelists. So firstly, I'm going to ask each of you to run through um, in about a few minutes, just presenting your key perspectives on nature-based solutions, your project, or where you're coming from, uh, before we drill down on elements that really support successful implementation of these projects. So um, maybe we can start with you, Albert. Um, you can yeah i'm unmuted now correct <laughs> yes i can hear you perfectly okay that's nice um yeah good morning good evening uh where you are um my name is albert Voss, project manager manager uh at the program of uh, ed 2050 aims dollar uh, 2050 uh here on the map you can see uh, uh where it is all about it's the northern part of the netherlands uh, maybe you can uh show the first slides that's more helpful in this case um no the green map but yes that one um yeah we don't have mountains here in the netherlands and uh, and uh, instead we have a low-lying uh, a coastal zone uh, behind uh, the dikes in the, the hard coastal uh, line and um the main goals are here in uh, in some and uh, we try to to um, construct here uh, and investigate in a, a climate adaptive coastal zone and we have now 14 projects in this region from uh, the harbor of Eemshaven uh, until the border of uh, Germany and we also collaborate with Germany uh, to see it as a, as, as a one system what it is in essence um, uh, and uh, the, the essence of this uh, program is to uh, make use of the surplus of uh, silt in the estuary because of the econo economy uh, which has uh, um, uh, yeah, dredge. Uh, um, yeah, the, there is a surplus of, of silt because of the dredging and the economy uh, in the region. Um, and uh, um, on the other hand, maybe the next slide is uh, helpful in that way. Um, we have a low-lying uh, um, uh, coastal zone with problems as uh, um, uh, peat oxidation, uh, soil extraction, and uh, yeah, soil subsidence. And um, we try to uh, combine uh, those uh, two elements uh, to uh, yeah, turning different challenges into uh, opportunity um into uh, three aims and uh, to make use of a natural silt trap uh, which you can see as a um, uh, ecosystem services but also uh, make use in an artificial way to uh, make use of the dredged uh, sediments to uh, raising uh, agricultural lands uh, which is uh, also subsiding 
um, and also to raping clay to enforce uh, dikes uh, where it can be uh, a soft line, you can say. Um, so the core aim is to develop together with the local community and the parties in the region a healthy climate adaptive coastal zone in both an economic and an ecological way. So that's the core line of this program. So that's it for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Abba. Maybe we can go on with um, now with Ole. Yes, hello, this is Ole Fried reporting from Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, next slide, please. Copenhagen is the capital city of Denmark. Uh, it's a coastal city and it's prone to flooding, uh, in particular storm surges from the south. To address that, there are discussions about how to protect the city. In particular, there's a discussion about a 50 kilometer long uh, necklace surrounding the city, which is a, a blue-green coastal infrastructure uh, system that also protects the city. There are three existing precedents in this area. Uh, next slide, please. To the south, it's the, um, uh, the Ku Bay Beach Park, which was inaugurated in 1980. It's a 70-kilometer beach park with coastal lagoons, um, uh, three marinas, and also, it's also a storm surge barrier. The second generation is the Amago Beach Park, which is from 2005, uh, closer to the city center and a part of the, an urban revitalization project in the western part of Copenhagen. And what is the most recent uh, part of this is a new uh, land uh, reclamation project and urban expansion project of the city uh, center of Copenhagen called Lunederholm. And it's just uh, in the very early stages, but construction is actually ongoing. It's also heavily debated in terms of the level of sustainability and this approach and this project. But at the end of the day, these three examples do show some precedents of how to approach this in Danish context. Um, so next slide, please. Some of the key messages from the, the first president is that it was actually, is it a, an example of a Nordic welfare state flagship project um, uh, led by the Social Democratic Party at the time um, and uh, about providing access to recreational landscapes and creating uh, landscapes quote, in proximity to new urban development areas. Uh, next slide. The current discussion uh, in a co uh, Danish context is about uh, what to do in the so most southernmost parts of the, of, the, um, of the city. And uh, there's a discussion about this uh, Drauer living shoreline. There's been architectural competitions and so on. And what it actually shows is a succession of different nature-based solutions over time. It, it acknowledges the known unknowns, in particular, the interactions between groundwater, um, stormwater and seawater now and into the future. Uh, it also addresses the issue of coastal squeeze and uh, a transformation of land uh, and replacement of farmland into coastal wetlands into the future. And it also indi indicates a change from less is more to more is more, both in terms of land allocation, in terms of uh, multifunctionality, in terms of financing, um, and also in terms of stakeholder involvement. Uh, this has been a very high level of community engagement. Actually, this project is, is 15 years into the process and nothing major has been built on the ground yet. Um, some of the issues is for discussion is really the balancing of natural cost and benefits now and into the future. For instance, uh, much, much of this land is, is covered by nature, Natural 2000 um, legislation. So that's sort of the brief report from here, thanks. Thanks so much, Ole. Uh, maybe um, maintenant, uh, Didier, you can donate a uh, quelques perspectives uh, Did you? Very, oui, je, je vous entends, mais uh, assez, uh, um, assez petit le son. Allô, vous m'entendez maintenant? Oui. Vous m'entendez bien? OK, oui, on, on vous entend, mais la vidéo est un peu bizarre, mais <laughs> oui. C'est bon. C'est bon comme ça? OK. Voilà, donc, euh, moi, je m'appelle Didier Cabot, donc euh, je suis le conservateur de l'air marine protégée de saint au Sénégal. Donc, je vais vous faire la présentation et je serai accompagné par le docteur Moussa Sal du CSE. Euh, 
et le coordinateur du projet Waka FM. Donc euh, là, nous allons partager avec vous des expériences. Donc, euh, sur euh, la reconstitution binaire à Saint-Louis. Ah, bon. En effet, cette expérience euh, est entre dans le cadre donc, des solutions de l'adaptation ou de lutte contre les risques toxiques. N'est-ce pas? Ainsi, euh, pour la mise en œuvre de cette activité, donc, nous avons été accompagnés par plusieurs partenaires que nous ne pouvons pas ne pas citer. Bon, il y a le CSE, il y a le Conservatoire de la Santé, euh, il y a le CFM et éventuellement le comité de gestion, donc, euh, qui est l'instance du regroupe les communautés et en même temps, donc, euh, les, les, les agents de l'État. Voilà. Donc, maintenant, nous allons directement vous présenter un peu la solution. Donc, c'est une solution, donc, comme vous le voyez sur l'écran, euh, euh, sur la photo à gauche. Donc, euh, c'est des TIFA. Des TIFA, euh, c'est une plante envahissante, donc, c'est pour situer au Sénégal, au niveau du fleuve. Donc, ce qui bouche les couloirs vraiment de navigabilité du fleuve et tous les cours d'eau. Donc, c'est une plante qui fait beaucoup les Sénégalais. Euh, et que nous avons récolté, c'est ça. Et nous en avons fait des, 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 des palissades euh, et que nous avons installé au niveau de la partie qui est souvent euh, submergée euh, pendant les forces courtes. Donc, euh, si vous voyez bien, je ne sais pas pour ceux qui connaissent bien lui, ils savent que la langue de la barbarie est cette entre l'océan Atlantique et le flot Sénégal. Donc, c'est une petite bande de terre où facilement on avait des, 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 une forte érosion côtière. Donc, donc, il fallait amener une réponse, n'est-ce pas, à ces phénomènes. Donc, si à la langue, vous pouvez même amener des capsules sur la langue de Bagdad. Donc, c'est dans ce sens-là que les gens ont travaillé à la reconstitution de la zone un peu. Et c'est dans ce sens que nous avons installé ces capsules. Donc, c'est des palissades de 2 mètres de long, 1 mètre de hauteur. Donc, ils sont situés entre eux par des sites de de haut et nous avons déjà installé donc, euh, dans un premier temps sur une distance de 1 ou 5 km, ce qui va une direction nord-ouest. La direction nord-ouest, en fait, il fallait étudier et voir comment le processus de sédimentation se fait. Et les gens ont. Didier, euh, merci beaucoup. Mais le, le son est un peu trop difficile pour les interprèteurs. Alors, peut-être on, on va juste essayer de régler le problème, puis je, on vous revient avec des questions après, parce qu'en euh, en fait, les gens, ils entendent trop mal, ils, mais ils peuvent lire euh, tout euh, sur, les, euh, sur le projet, euh, sur les diapos, puis euh, je pense qu'on on peut revenir avec les questions, peut-être, euh, qu'on le sent est mieux. Um, so we're going to now move to, um, to Paul um, for his brief presentation. Can we move to Paul's presentation? Can we move the slides to Paul's presentation? And I don't know where Paul is, but um, we can move on, please. Thank you. So, uh, hi everyone. Good to be here today, so I'm Paul Says. Um, associate at Tyndall Centre and with my own consultancy. So if you just go back one slide, I'll just tell you the title of it. Uh, so I'll be thinking um, about the strategic response, what we've been doing on strategic responses. And I've called this a time for a transformational change at the coast. So next slide. <clears throat> so we undertook uh, some recent work for the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment on flooding. Um, and it's clear this graph is trying to show the total adaptation benefit against uh, in the expected annual damage. And it, with climate change, if we look out to the 2080s, the big orange bar there is highlighting that the amount of risk we will be managing out through adaptation is due to grow significantly. And what that provides us is an opportunity to manage that risk in a, in a more uh, rounded way 
and proactively seek multiple benefits. And that's where uh, nature-based approaches come in, in part of that adaptation story. So there's a lot of risk that we will be managing, increasing risk that we'll be managed in the future, regardless of how we do it. Um, and if we do it proactively, we can move away from the conventional approaches where possible and do a more nature-based approach. So next slide. So the opportunity is uh, significant. Um, but we need to know a little bit more than that if we're going to do it successfully. So this piece of work here from a recent paper we published on um, the scale of the transform transformational challenge around England's coast is highlighting that not all places at the coast have equal challenge. Uh, on the left there, present day risks through to the 2080s on the right, darker the red, the greater the risk. So we need to be able to have foresight on where those locations are and where we might be able to implement uh, an alternative, uh, more transformational response. And where we do need to, uh, we need to work obviously closely with the communities and helping them respond to that challenge. But this is, if we can start that debate now about how we get there and where we go, um, that, that's a real discussion we need now. And next slide. And I thought just to highlight, if people don't know it, in the UK, uh, there's this process called shoreline management planning, which are based on sediment cells. And they, they set out, hold the line, whether we're going to manage retreat, whether we're going to advance the line, or whether we're going to have no active intervention at any particular place around the coast. And they've been really a good vehicle, but they can do more because they can start being much more closely integrated with spatial planning much more closely integrated with community uh, collaboration and local authority co collaboration to try and set out how we're going to manage the shoreline over the long term and those these approaches are being taken up in other countries as well uh, this idea of the shoreline management plan to set out how we want to respond to the coast including where we want to uh, adopt more nature-based uh, responses to the coastal management Okay, next and final slide. And one of the pieces of work we've been doing for an interreg project around the North Sea coast, looking at how we manage the coastline around the North Sea, we've developing this approach called cloud to coast approach that uh, sets out how we might think of moving towards a resilient society. And one of the aspects of that is this inclusive approach how you connect communities into that discussion, a whole system, so how you think up and down drift in the coastline and in the associated catchment, and how you continue to adapt by having that long-term uh, vision. So setting out that debate of where we want to go in the future is a real enabler uh, of having innovative responses of how we get there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, so everybody for, the, for your presentations. We have uh, time for discussion now and there's already a lot of uh, questions in the chat. Um, if people want to ask questions in the room in Groninger as well, that would be great to hear from you. Um, uh, maybe if someone can enter those questions in the chat, I can, I'm having problems seeing the, the, the questions in the Google Doc, but um, um, I would love to hear from people in Groningen. So, um, I was wondering uh, for Ore, maybe uh, there's like a long history of nature-based solutions in um, in Denmark. How are the like the ecosystem service benefits of um, of the the solutions? How 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 are they being accounted for, and has that changed over the years? Thanks. That's a um, question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, one can say that uh, this um, approach to nature-based solution uh, in coastal areas is kind of the second wave of nature-based solutions as a climate change adaptation approach in the Danish context. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago, there was the same emerging discussion regarding stormwater management uh, from uh, stormwater management predominantly done in sewers to also now on the urban surface using um, sustainable urban drainage systems, both vegetated and non-vegetated as a part, integrated part of the urban, urban landscape. Um, and that has also created then, a, well, there's been a 20, 20 year transition process that I mean, mindset change, changes in legislation. And now it's more or less an, an kind of a new normal uh, in the Danish context when it comes to stormwater management. And now we, for the past five, six years, we've been on the same trajectory when it comes to coastal areas. 
Uh, we've made a review still more than 80% of all projects that are being discussed are uh, kind of conventional hard coastal protection measures, um, flood walls, dikes, sluice gates and so forth. But there have also been some initiatives, for instance, a larger philanthropic trust have um, invested in, uh, in 20 different cities, uh, invested, uh, supported municipalities to develop projects that are kind of challenging the conventional approaches. And that has actually um, resulted in, in, in the process where things are starting to change. Uh, for instance, I presented this Kerr Bay Beach Park, which is 40 years old, but that's kind of been rediscovered as, a, as an interesting and relevant um, um, uh, business case to review. Um, when it comes to nature-based solutions, there's actually also a practical issue regarding the, the financing aspects. In, in Denmark, um, uh, coastal protection is based on a beneficiary pays principle. Um, and if public the public sector needs to co-finance, it needs to be for the, the greater good of society at large. And uh, so when it comes to some uh, recreational benefits, public access to beaches, environmental gains, ed educational value, human health, benefits and so on, some of the intangible values, those are actually um, arguments for public co-financing. Uh, so there have been made models and assessments which actually um, um, document those uh, intangible values and nature-based solutions seem to harness many of those multiple benefits more than conventional uh, approaches. That's really interesting because I think the financing and, and capturing finance, private financing is something that many countries are very much looking at at the moment because a lot of financial companies are very much more interested in natural capital also. Um, that's really interesting. I might come back to you on that. Um, so, Paul, I was wondering from a UK perspective whether you could also comment on how uh, the benefits of nature-based solutions are made to kind of make a long-term business case. Uh, yeah, the, so the benefits, uh, th there's two versions that typically get included. They can be included in the multi-criteria type assessment. So the, um, and then weighed up without monetizing, or you can uh, try and attempt to incorporate it in a monetized um, way through, uh, um, various ways of, of valuing it, contingent value methods, willingness to pay methods, etc. And you are able to incorporate those, but they're always incorporated from a, a, a public funding perspective. So at the coast, most of our work is done from a public funded uh, perspective, a little bit of private, but it always comes from the public good. So you have to think about it from a, um, an, a national public economic perspective. But in our choices at the coast, we have a um, what's called a priority weighting system and one of those weights is the environmental improvement to the uh, so you can incorporate uh, amenity benefits access benefits as well as uh, benefits to nature itself in in the process however saying that it is quite more difficult to incorporate nature-based benefits into the hard calculations alongside the economic benefits. So there tends to be a little mismatch between uh, the weight of the evidence given to those two things because we are uh, more used and more able to value those uh, more traditional economic benefits than we are the nature-based benefits. But, the, but it's not straightforwardly on an economic benefit case you can make the case for uh, of these wider benefits but it's on a project by project uh, basis great thanks for that Paul. maybe um i'm also um so that money is one thing obviously to get a successful project on the ground and uh, there's a lot of people interested in funding so i might come back to the funding question but i just wanted to ask um what other elements uh, are kind of key in helping the project go forward? I was wondering if Albert could answer that, particularly um, since your project is more innovative, kind of what has been uh, key to kind of getting that successfully on the ground other than money? Other than money. Now we use uh, sediment in the system nearby. So it's a circular principle, you can mm -hmm. say. Um, that we combine the, the, the problems to, to opportunity, what I said. Um, and farmers in the, in the region are very enthusiastic uh, to uh, um, yeah, um, 
receive the, the sediment to raising their agricultural land to, to uh, give them a perspective for the future. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's a benefit that is not uh, only um, into, into money, you can say. So yeah, that's great because it's kind of using something that's seen as uh, not useful, but making it useful, right? Um, so the circular economy idea is uh, also a great opportunity. Um, Didier, je ne sais pas si vous, uh, vous nous entendez ou uh, si le son est, est mieux. Est-ce que, est que le son marche maintenant? Oui, 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 c'est bon, c'est bon. OK, ça c'est bon. bon. OK, bon, maintenant je vous entends. Um, ouais. Je voulais aussi uh, demander un peu la même question au Sénégal, uh, à part l'argent. Uh, mm -hmm. Quel était le les, les, facteur très important pour l'implémentation des, des projets de restauration des dunes? Euh, voilà, merci. Merci pour la question. Euh, Moussa, euh, Doyen? Oui, oui. Euh, Moussa Sal? Oui, oui, merci beaucoup, Captain. Euh, bonjour voilà, à je... tous. Voilà, c'est bon. C'est bon, allez-y. Oui, oui. Euh, moi, c'est Moussa Sal, du Centre psychologique de Dakar. Donc, je suis la, la tutelle technique du ministère de, de l'Environnement et du Développement durable. Et je coordonne en même temps euh, l'Observatoire régional du littoral ouest africain qui est en train d'être mis en place. Donc, sur le projet au niveau de la langue de Barbary, je crois que l'un des facteurs clés euh, de réussite, euh, c'est que nous sommes dans une zone protégée, une aire marine protégée, avec une équipe de gestionnaires qui est sur place, et, euh, qui a déjà beaucoup d'expérience euh, dans ce genre d'activité. Et ensuite, il y a eu une, une combinaison d'actions avec euh, le projet WACA, euh, avec l'unité de gestion du projet WACA au niveau du Sénégal, qui a complété également les activités euh, en renforçant certains dispositifs euh, de protection du milieu qui réduisaient un peu l'accès énergique euh, qui, était, euh, qui, était, qui existait auparavant. Ensuite, il y a eu un matériel, la, la disponibilité du matériel local. Le capitaine Kabou a parlé un peu du TIFA, ce matériel local qui était disponible, une plante euh, envahissante, qui a été utilisée euh, effectivement pour mettre en place ce dispositif-là. Et enfin, euh, l'air marine protégé, l'équipe de l'air marine protégé a aussi bénéficié d'un appui technique euh, du Conservatoire du littoral euh, de France pour euh, mettre en place cette technique qui a été présentée par le capitaine Cabo. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Moussa. Um, okay, uh, but, um, now I think uh, we, I, I'm looking at some of the questions in the um, in the chat and uh, on the, the Google Doc, which I can now see. Thank you very much for that. Um, one person, uh, which I think is a very interesting question, um, uh, which I'm hoping Paul can maybe help us answer, is um, does the 10% target for biodiversity net gain already show an impact in how we're using nature-based solutions along the coast in the UK? And I think that, that's something that I find interesting because it's, uh, you know, having to demonstrate net gain in biodiversity is uh, hopefully going to make a difference, Paul? Yeah, I think it will make a, a, a difference. Um, that's definitely another excellent driver to the to what kind of choices are made in, in different places. The challenge is always uh, in locations where you're also trying to protect people as well. Um, it's, it's definitely a driver for those places where there's opportunities to, to improve, uh, to reinstate uh, salt marsh in uh, agricultural areas where there's, it's, where you can realign even there it's quite tricky as we've heard from earlier speakers and there's definitely uh, 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 that target for net gain is definitely in strengthening the case for that it's um, more difficult in places where uh, there's a, a more direct influence on on property and people so we've got a few places around the coast where that discussion of realignment is uh, taking place and i wouldn't say the net gain plays into those places it plays into increasing the case for realigning in places where you're more agricultural based or or more much more sparsely populated but it definitely is featuring i'm not sure it's yet featured 
but it is definitely featuring in the in the discussions. Thanks so much. Um, hey, maybe uh, I'm interested to, to explore the local community aspect. You know, you kind of you know we are protecting people in many of these coastal projects. So I wanted to just go back to Ole and ask uh, how Denmark citizens act attitude or level of involvement has changed and because you you have a series a, a, a rich history in Denmark um I've just wondered how people's attitudes have changed towards these kind of solutions yeah thank you um for the question um yeah I mean first of all there, there is this beneficiary pays principle I mean, it means that at the end of the day it's the local community that need to pay themselves uh, and the organizing cooperatives uh, where that the municipalities can be facilitators and they can be co, co do some co-financing but at the end of the, end of the day the local communities need to agree on on a on a technical solution and also financing model for that or um, to how, how much the cost would be. But things are actually changing. Uh, I showed this example of Luneta Holm to the, in the northern part of Copenhagen where there's a lot of opposition public debates about whether this is sustainable. What about the marine ecosystems? How are they affected by this land reclamation project? Um, so it seems actually that, that we there's a, some kind of a battle or, uh, or we had a crossroad between human interests, um, kind of human-centered economic interests uh, and then environmental interests. Um, it's been seen in that particular project in, in Copenhagen, but there's also another case which uh, uh, was finalized two, three years ago after eight years of a legal battle between environmental interests and human-centered interests. Uh, so there seems to be an increase in increased recognition about the environmental impacts um, and um, of, of well, well, the need to actually acknowledge um, non-human species in, in developing sustainable solutions in coastal areas. And the, and the public, uh, the general public is, has a very strong voice in this. Great. Um, and in terms of uh, maybe if we can go to Albert, uh, Albert, sorry, I'm going all French on you. Um, I just wondered what the, the local farmers and agricultural community, uh, what, what they think about the, the innovative project that you're doing. Yeah, what I said, is that they are uh, very uh, uh, enthusiastic um, about opportunity that they have, that they can have a, um, yeah, a perspective. Um, but there is also a need for um, um, yeah, renewing the way of agricultural uh, um, um, action in this region. So uh, it, it has to be also in balance with, with, uh, with nature in this region. So uh, therefore, uh, we try to make a kind of a landscape uh, plan for uh, a balanced a functioning of uh, agricultural uh, uh, activities and uh, natural activities, uh, natural um, yeah benefits. So um, yeah, they, they see the urgency and um, yeah they support us uh, so far. So that's uh, that's a good news. And we we try to uh, uh, create uh, building blocks and to determine together uh, a plan for this region uh, in the future. Great, thank you. Well, at this point, I'd just like to bring in a couple more people to the discussion. And we have a couple more people, uh, experts on, on the line who are joining us. Um, so we have Floris Bouga, who's a senior consultant at Del Terres, as well as lecturing at Hans University of Applied Sciences in Honingen. Uh, we have Arona Suma, who is principal climate change and regrowth officer at the African Development Bank, and uh, Vicky Lin, who is project manager at Blue 21, also in the Netherlands. Um, so I wonder to, so we've, we've been talking a lot about kind of some specific case studies and, uh, and projects, uh, but I'm wondering maybe if I come to you, Floris, Floris first, um, if you can reflect on some of the key policy recommendations that we should be making building on the case studies and discussion we've already had in order to really upscale and replicate these uh, nature-based solutions in other areas and to kind of uh, spread out the good work. Yeah, thanks. It was really interesting to see all those uh, case studies around the world. Actually, some of them uh, I have been in, uh, involved as well. I think a uh, key for, uh, well, legislation or policy is always the evidence-based part. So uh, what you hear now as well, we should do more research on the cost benefits because th that's a barrier. 
there's a lot of doubt about implementing nature-based solutions large scale or small scale because there's uh, not a, uh, awareness so you have to raise awareness or capacity building or a wider understanding for it because if if i hear all the case studies mostly uh, we we don't understand fully enough that it's really multidisciplinary it's not only about uh, uh, green and gray, as you say, but it, there's policy makers, there are uh, people that have to do the maintenance. It's about blue, it's about a lot of colors actually, and they have to work together. So I think that's, that's very key. So uh, coming uh, from a research environment, uh, most of the things w w that is going on in these case studies, of course, is to make it evidence-based and then uh, return it to policy because that's helping uh, to take the, the right decisions in, in this case. So, uh, so that that will be key for policy is uh, do more research and uh, share international examples. That what we're doing now, of course, and uh, raising awareness and uh, capacity building is is quite important. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, so many many places there, we're still going to kind of traditional engineering solutions as the first go to, and then we're kind of thinking, oh, maybe we could do something more innovative. What would you yeah. say to kind of communities that are really starting from engineered solutions um, in a traditional way? Yeah, from my exper uh, experience, uh, a lot of examples do help. When I uh, graduated from the uh, University of Delft, I spent time in Bangladesh, where um, mainly the Dutch were making dikes, very hard, gray infrastructure, so to say. And actually, the, 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 the residents from that area uh, broke the dikes because there was not fresh uh, soil on the land, uh, no fish ponds were, were uh, filled up again. So there was a lot of resistance to that. And we paid so much uh, money and uh, capacity and cost and, and everything. So we, we did some damage as well with gray infrastructure. And I think that that should be stressed. And it's not that gray infrastructure uh, uh, will replace uh, by green infrastructure, of course not, but I think these stories people relate to, and that really helps to tell the story. And uh, it's about, well, ecosystem uh, services, as you as you presented, it's about water quality. It's about so many benefits. So if we really share those benefits, there's a wider understanding for why we should do this, and it would help to implement more uh, nature-based solutions, I would say. Yeah. And presumably, we also need to make space for nature-based solutions. Sometimes through through things like the avoid, um, like zoning, and kind of making sure that we're making space where we haven't already encroached, um, yeah. and retreating where we 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 can't, where it's unattainable. I guess, um, like kind of unsustainable in the long term to yeah. stay. We're, we're kind of um, in Canada. We're having these kind of discussions too um, at the moment. Um, okay, maybe we can move to you, Vicky. Um, uh, one element that I know is being explored in several areas is, is floating homes and cities. And, and actually at the University of Waterloo, where I, um, I work, we have the Buoyant Foundation Project, which is kind of looking exactly at that. So I was just wondering, um, is, our, is our coastal future floating as we host sea level rise? Is there a place for that? Thank you, Jana. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, as you also mentioned that um, uh, we need to look at the strategic and long term approaches to deal with the future challenges and there's actually no uh, perfect uh, solutions, but we need to uh, um, experiment the different uh, good practice and to see how different uh, contexts will respond to them. And also to build uh, upon what uh, Paul introduced that um, there's uh, an increasing risk that we are facing and we will have to um, experiment more and to look at all alternatives. And currently um, we see a lot of coastal uh, cities uh, that face uh, challenges such as uh, uh, land scarcity or uh, urbanization and overpopulation. The most conventional way for them to uh, find a space is uh, uh, through land reclamation. But actually uh, land reclamation uh, can be quite uh, detrimental to uh, the ecosystem. Uh, imagine you know, having the whole uh, seabed just uh, covered uh, by rocks and sand and yeah um i mean with all respect but um ola you introduced the uh, uh, home uh, from uh, copenhagen uh, you also mentioned that the environmental uh, in, um, aspects have been quite a uh, controversial and this actually um in the case of uh, denmark um 
the, you are also lucky to have uh, the material. However, for uh, some other coastal uh, cities that um, seek for land reclamation solutions, but without having those sand or soil materials, they will have to find the material elsewhere. And this actually encourages uh, the rise of the sand mafia from uh, more uh, yeah, developing countries. And so um, if you look at the land reclamation and uh, floating solutions, actually in the long term, uh, then reclamation also uh, is not as uh, adaptive as a, a floating house or floating community as it will adapt to changing water levels. And it actually also creates um, extra habitat for the ecosystem. And uh, coming back to also what the floor is mentioned that uh, in response to uh, legislation and rules, uh, it's very important to have evidence. And um, Blue21, we also have a sister company uh, called Indimo, uh, which does uh, um, on, uh, water quality and uh, ecology monitoring using aquatic drones. So uh, drones that would uh, collect the uh, um, data and also images um, from uh, activities underneath the floating structure. And if you're interested, uh, I, I invited you to visit the website of uh, Indimo. Um, there's an uh, open access uh, data Database uh, on um, different evidence uh, collected uh, from different floating uh, cases around the world. You could see that uh, um, actually floating uh, does yeah. have a, a positive uh, environmental impact um, in comparison to land reclamation. Great, thanks, Vicky. Um, I'm just going to go to maybe go to some of the questions. We have a few questions in um, the chat and the Google Doc now. Um, so one one question that uh, is comment integrer les connaissances traditionnelles des peuples autochtones à cette nouvelle approche basée sur la nature. Um, Peut-être je je vais prendre cette question moi-même parce que je, je, on, on a beaucoup de, um, de discussions en ce moment au Canada sur la réconciliation et décolonisation avec les groupes autochtones. Uh, puis, uh, ben, de, de mon, mon expérience personnelle uh, avec les discussions, uh, les, les autochtones, ce n'est pas une nouvelle approche pour eux. Parce que eux, ils, ils, ont, ils ont travaillé avec la nature, c'est comme la base de la, de la vie. Puis le système de valeur, comme ils m'ont expliqué, c'est que la nature est vraiment en haut. Euh, puis c'est le plus important pour eux, c'est pas l'argent. Euh, alors c'est comme un, un système de valeur complètement différent que le nôtre. Euh, puis euh, ils il, il se voient euh, moins dans nos, nos paysages, en fait, qu'on sépare la nature de, de les communautés, puis on protège ou on sépare. Euh, puis l'approche basée ou fondée sur la nature, euh, en fait, ils voient plus comme une... Euh, ils m'ont ils, ils expliqué qu'ils voient ça comme une façon de reconnecter avec la nature, reconnecter avec la terre, le, se revoir dans les paysages euh, autour du Canada, um, de, de, comme, de, de, de retourner à des, des façons de faire qu'ils avaient, ils avaient l'habitude, en fait, euh, avant la colonisation. Euh, je ne suis pas autochtone, mais c'est cette pour les expériences que les gens ils ont partagées avec moi pendant les discussions. Um, uh, alors, c'est la question. Je ne sais, um, je sais pas si d'autres membres, does that, any of the panel, other panel members wish to comment on in, involving traditional knowledge from indigenous groups? I don't know whether anyone else has experience with this. Well, if not, we will move on to another question. Uh, we have a time for a couple of more questions, I think. I'm just like, looking to see um, what else we have. Um, we have a question on forced migration, or I guess, and relocation, and how we can uh, we can manage this on the coast. And I think um, you know this is a a growing conversation of kind of when when it's unsustainable and when we actually need to think about retreat. Um, I don't know who is some, somebody on the panel has an experience of retreat. Maybe um, Paul. I think in the in the UK we've had several managed retreat projects um, go a, go ahead, and several of those SMP sections are actually either do nothing or retreat now. Right? Uh, what's the conversation been like around that? Yeah, it's a difficult conversation. The, there are uh, places where we've had managed realignment. Largely, they they haven't 
as yet influenced uh, or impacted too many people, but there are live debates. So there's uh, a, a well-known place on, on in Wales on Fairbourne, where it's a discussion around um, a, a managed realignment, moving from a hold the line to a managed realignment policy. And how do you actually do that? How do you support communities in making that uh, transition, uh, including financial support? And over the time scale, many years of how you actually do that. And we've recently published a paper exploring the scale of that challenge and the fact that it will take many, many years uh, to transition from hold the line to manage realignment. And we need better, better mechanisms to support communities where that is, is the case. Um, so, so far, manage realignment is identified in the SMPs. It's identified more than we are implementing. So it's, it's, it's uh, identified in more locations than we are implementing. But the discussion around how you do that and how you support communities in that process and the justice issues around that and the uh, how you do it fairly are all um, uh, central discussions. And we've got a series of what are called Pathfinder studies to try and explore that both in a flood coastal flood perspective and a coastal uh, erosion perspective primarily how how do you make that transition and that's a central focus for a, a series of funding that's just come out for so-called pathfinder studies to think about how how you do that to date most of the discussion of realignment has been in places where uh, it's agricultural land or uh, more mobile inherently more mobile homes caravans etc there's uh, the discussion when it's a, a well-established community, been there, had protection for many years. Um, that debate is just getting going, but we're trying. Yeah. We are trying to highlight this this need to have a, a, a real clear, honest discussion about how our risks will change in the long term with sea level rise, which isn't a, not a lot of uncertainty in sea level rise anymore. We can argue the the quantum, but the, it, we're pretty sure it's going to be within a particular range uh, and how we respond to that is is a real active discussion great thank you um so uh there's also a question in the chat about um ecosystem accounting which i find particularly interesting um because i think uh we're, we're doing a, a fair bit of work in canada in trying to get the benefits recognized in terms of the services they provide communities and for and communities we, we actually have uh i think about 40 odd different local governments that now have valued their natural assets and actually want to put them on their financial statements. Uh, at the moment, the Public Sector Accounting Board, there's a rule where we can't put inherited natural assets on our financial statements, which we're trying to reverse at the moment so that people can actually have natural assets as a as a asset line in, the, in their financial position statement. Um, and actually the it's not coastal, but the city of Calgary actually did this exercise and discovered that the fourth most valuable group of assets that they had were natural assets, um, which I think you know pushes it up the agenda. I just wondered whether any of the any of the panel has experience on uh, natural capital accounting and how that's influencing the the discussion around nature based solutions in your country. No. Yeah. Well, only that is that is again gathering traction uh, in the UK and particularly that idea of uh, natural assets and conventional assets all have formed part of an asset management perspective uh, and uh, uh, natural capital accounting is part part of that story so you were able to put natural features alongside conventional inf infrastructure features you know on a common way that is definitely uh, starting again to, to have impact. Great. Um, we have a comment in the chat also about um, some of the um, Indigenous groups. Uh, so in, um, says, Tom says, in, in building with nature project in Indonesia, 
whether to restore the mangrove greenbelt and sustainable aquaculture, the local communities were actively involved from the start and their knowledge was extremely valuable. And um, je voulais juste toucher sur ce point avec M. Didier, parce que je sais que dans nos discussions préliminaires, vous avez euh, noté l'implication de la communauté euh, dans le, les projets de restauration au, euh, au Sénégal et au Saint-Louis. Um, alors, je voulais voir si vous pouvez commenter sur le rôle de la communauté dans, dans les projets que vous avez implémentés. Euh, pardon, s'il vous plaît, vous pouvez répéter la question, s'il vous plaît? Je voulais juste voir si vous pouvez commenter sur le rôle de la communauté dans les projets de restauration. Ah, d'accord, d'accord. Voilà, donc, euh, euh, au niveau de l'AMP de Saint-Louis, donc ce projet, comme l'a dit tout à l'heure euh, le doyen Moussa Sall, sur les facteurs de réussite, donc il a un peu parlé, euh, donc de, de la structure qui existait déjà, qui est le, le, l'AMP. Mais l'AMP a un mode de gestion euh, qui est basé sur le, une, une co-gestion. Donc, il y a les communautés et il y a l'État. Maintenant, tout, les, tout, tout, tout ce qui est prise de décision est fait de manière collégiale entre les communautés et l'AMP. Et c'est dans ce sens que les communautés sont en amont euh, euh, jusqu'en aval donc, de tout le processus de mise en œuvre de, de, de ce projet. Donc, ils sont, ils, sont, ils sont des parties prenantes, notamment, ils sont des parties prenantes depuis euh, la conception du projet, donc euh, jusqu'à sa mise en œuvre en passant par le suivi qui est actuellement est, euh, en train d'être fait. Bon, parce que les populations et les communautés, euh, avait l'habitude de, de, d'utiliser cette zone-là pour faire du maraîchage. Mais avec le passage de la brèche, en 2003, cette zone a été complètement dégradée. Mais ils ont vu qu'il y a de l'intérêt derrière la mise en œuvre de ces, de ces tifavelles qui a fait qu'on a pu piéger du sable, reconstituer des dunes et en même temps reconstituer les écosystèmes. Au-delà de ça, ils se sont installés euh, donc maintenant en aval donc, de, de ces tifavelles pour faire du maraîchage. Si vous voyez un peu la photo que, euh, sur, le, sur, sur la diapo, la dernière photo, c'est des, des casiers où on a installé des maraîchers pour faire des activités socio-économiques. Et ils s'en sortent énormément puisque au, au, au temps, ces communautés étaient des pêcheurs. Maintenant, aujourd'hui, ils se sont, sont reconvertis à, au maraîchage et ils trouvent qu'ils euh, ont, ils ont beaucoup plus de revenus en pratiquant ce maraîchage-là que la pêche où ils se retrouvaient avec des gains un peu plus petits. Donc, c'est dans ce sens que les populations se sont appropriées donc, cet outil. Euh, quand euh, les gens doivent installer ces, ces tifavelles, ils, ils sont des parties prenantes et c'est eux-mêmes qui confectionnent ces tifavelles donc, pour venir les vendre au projet. Donc, en retour, ils ont, ils ont de l'argent. Donc, euh, euh, en vendant ces, ces tifavelles au projet. Ils sont des parties prenantes et ils se chargent aussi du suivi donc, euh, de, ces, de ces tifavelles. Euh, donc, euh, je peux dire que euh, surtout euh, donc, le, la mise en œuvre du projet, ces populations, ces communautés ont été les, les fers de lance donc, pour la réussite de ce, de ce projet. Excellent. Je pense que c'est un bon exemple de comment le, le, les projets basés sur la nature, ça peut insérer dans une économie locale, puis valoriser et amener autre chose. Et ça, 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 ça démontre aussi que le, le, la population s'adapte à, à adapter avec la nature, qu'ils ont changé de la pêche à la maraîchage. Donc, je pense que c'est un, c'est un très bel exemple. Um, Okay, I well we we have a we have a few minutes left. Um, I'm just trying to see whether there's a, a, another any other burning questions, and so I can read out some of the great comments in the chat. Um, some of them uh, a lot of interest in the financial side, so it's a shame we don't have a bit more time to talk about that. Um, there are also a lot of links in the in the in the, the chat that I, I recommend you will we'll, we'll try and capture somehow. Um, I just wanted to say a few words before we before we do end that um, to try and sum up a little bit of the discussion. Um, so I think 
from everybody, pretty much I've heard about um, strategic approach uh, that is kind of nested in, in natural processes and the fact that we're kind of at a bit of a tipping point, it seems, between kind of having this as a innovative um, solution to kind of more towards the new normal solution, I think Ole mentioned in his in his presentation. So some countries are obviously uh, more ahead of the game in this area than others, um, and we can learn from each other. Uh, also that one size doesn't necessarily fit all we've heard about very different projects in different regions of the world, um, and the importance for them to be kind of um, beneficial to people, and, and, and I guess in a sense place-based uh, projects that take into account the, the, where they're situated and the people living there. Um, I have a comment that maybe green and gray make dark green. <laughs> so maybe, we, you know, with these hybrid solutions, like in some, in some ways, uh, nature-based solutions or purely nature-based solutions may not be attainable, but maybe, maybe these dark green solutions are something that we can achieve. Um, so some, maybe making the benefits clear, uh, we've had a lot of discussion about, um, about how this is, I think that the local economy um, discussion, um, the examples of, of Didier and uh, also of Albert, of how um, there we, we're looking at more at the circular economy and, and benefits from these nature-based solutions really to the, the local people that are living with the solutions. And I think it's incredible. We're still finding innovative ways to work with natural processes. Natural processes are, are natural, but we're, we're still evolving in how we work with them. Um, and I think one thing that always strikes me is not all innovation is technology. So, and you know, this is not necessarily technology, but it's more kind of understanding how we can work with, with natural physical processes. So when we say innovation, sometimes we always think of kind of machines and electronics, but it's uh, this is the opposite, which I, I fully embrace, definitely. Um, so this has been a really stimulating discussion. And um, I'm kind of sad that the time is kind of finishing, uh, to be honest, because um, this is kind of what I live and breathe and it's why I do my job. So um, it's been great. Thank you so much to all the panelists for your time and for providing your perspectives from around the world. And I'm sure, you know, if people want to follow up, they can, can search you out on LinkedIn and ask you the, the questions. We haven't got to the, quite the end of the questions, but, um, uh, you know, we can continue the discussion. Uh, so it's been, this event has been organized by the water adaptation community of the Global Center on Adaptation. So um, there is a chance to continue the discussion online. You can join the community. You can contribute your materials to the community, provide your resources, join the discussions uh, and contribute. Um, and I real, really think that this demonstrates how by sharing our knowledge between the Netherlands, Denmark, the UK, Senegal, Canada, we can actually try and pinpoint some examples. I think what uh, Flores said about having examples in our pocket to show how this works and how this can work better. Um, it's also, so when we share our examples, we kind of broaden the evidence base that this works and can help uh, really solidify our arguments when we're, we're fighting their corner for this, because I, I know not everybody is uh, on the same wavelength at the moment. Um, so the, the summary and the recording of the webinar will be available on the Water Adaptation Community website. Um, and I would really like, encourage you to join that community and take active part. And the discussion with the private sector stakeholders in Koningen uh, will now continue in Dutch. Um, and that's on until four o'clock local time. Um, thank you so much to all our panelists uh, for your time and for our hosts and uh, all the people in the audience who've asked so many questions great questions and personally I would love to hear from you more if you if you want to talk about this I'm the person you can always talk about it to because um, I'm this is kind of my my career drive is to basically get these things implemented more in Canada as well now so uh, anything you can provide to help me do that I will be very very much receptive so um so thank you to everybody uh, merci uh, and uh, I can't, I can't Sorry, I don't know. Thank you in touch. <laughs> um, it's been great, and uh, I hope to speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Okay.
Así. 